Before we start our second session of this six Widening the Pipeline virtual training, I'd like to thank our sponsors, the Evelyn Y. Davis Foundation, Bayer, Johnson & Johnson, and Twitter. This next session, we'll be focusing on a publication called Inside Climate News. It was founded in 2007 and provides unbiased, nonpartisan reporting on climate change that's intended to inform the national and global conversation around environmental issues. Veteran journalist Sonia Ross is the managing editor of Inside Climate News, and she's here today to provide us with some perspectives on the need for more journalists of color to identify and articulate the impacts of climate change. Sonia, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me, Rachel, and the National Press Foundation. I love the work that you all do in trying to make sure that our journalists out here are equipped with the tools that they need to do this job. And um, a special shout out to all of you, all these wonderful faces that I'm seeing out here. I really would like to thank you for choosing this profession. Um, your voices are so vitally needed and your points of view are so vitally needed and you have your place propping up the pillar of the fourth estate. So thank you for, for doing the work that you do. Well, you've just demonstrated what one of our most effective tools is at NPF, and that is bringing people like you to spaces where young people like these can learn from you, ask questions, and really sort of aspire to be where you are. So again, thank you for that. Before you get to, into your presentation, I would love it if you would give us some background on your own career journey and just give us some details about that. Oh my goodness. <laughs> um, I, I became a journalist because I always had been doing this thing we call um, journalism my whole life and 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 um after washing out as a biology major in college i realized i needed to give in to my natural inclinations and go become a journalist uh you know um, people of a certain vintage were encouraged <laughs> to go become doctors become lawyers you know uh, coming right out on the tail of the civil rights movement uh, that this is what you can do to have your greatest impact. So that's what I was buying into. But I did have crazy good verbal skills and wonderful language art skills. And so I made the choice to go into this profession instead. And I was amazed, number one, at how seldom uh, young people of color were and are encouraged to take on journalism as a career. And I realized the extent to which I've actually been able to do my part um, as a citizen of this world by doing this work. So I switched over to journalism when I was an undergraduate at uh, University of Georgia. I couldn't get a journalism job in that town, Athens, Georgia to save my life. So I transferred home to Georgia State University um, wobbled up the street to the Atlanta Journal-Constitution and, and took a job as a copy clerk in the library or what they called the morgue back then before the internet. That's where all the dead tree product went to reside. Sort of like, like a morgue or, you know, really it was more like a cemetery sometimes. Um, and I took that job rather than a copy clerk in the newsroom uh, job because it paid a dollar more an hour. Lord have mercy. So I was still <laughs> with journalism during the day and filing clips and photographs at night in the library. But what it taught me was how thorough you must be in researching the topics that you report on. So that, that was actually a useful job, even though it wasn't in the newsroom, sitting among the editors yelling, Cop! you know, um, I, I, Parlayed that into um, an internship at the Associated Press while I was in school. And um, that internship came with a job offer attached to it, which was nice. Uh, it's one of the best internships out there, really. 
I and I just kept riding the AP wave. Every time I thought about leaving or going to try out a different organization or a different format, they upped the ante. Here's another opportunity for you. And here's another opportunity for you. So I went from being uh, an intern in the Atlanta Bureau, where which is my hometown. Shout out to the ATL. Uh, I went from being an intern in the Atlanta Bureau to um, being a general assignment reporter in the Atlanta um, Bureau. And there hadn't been a lot of attention paid to maintaining contact with the, you know, coterie of civil rights leaders who were in that town. So I said, OK, let me make it my business to touch base with Coretta Scott King every now and then and Joseph Lowery and John Lewis, who then ran for Congress um, and and developed a really nice collection of sources. Uh, what I realized that early in my career is that it was vitally important to continue to tell the story of the transformation of the United States from an all white society or a majority white society, according to the images we saw, uh, to a truly multicultural, multiracial society. That was on my mind even back then in the late 1980s. So um, I started reporting that way. Um, centering race in the things that I reported on, including the Georgia legislature when I got bounced over to be uh, a state house reporter. And from there, courtesy of the LA riots and the beating police beating of, of Rodney King, I was promoted up to Washington to AP's national reporting staff to cover race and um, ethnicity, which at that time was buried under the euphemism of civil rights and urban affairs. Um, but I rode that wave as hard as I could. And um, the reporting apparently impressed the bureau chief because three years in on that beat, he assigned me to cover the White House. And even at the White House, where every, every issue comes to rest, I found abundant amounts of race news that needed to be reported out of that building. And that only reinforced my belief that the race beat was more valuable than it was being treated at the time. It was being treated as almost on par with the obituary desk or where you send where you send the troublemakers, where, you know, that desk in the back of the newsroom where they knock a few books off the table and you're facing a wall. Um, I said this subject needs to be lifted up out of obscurity and treated with the respect that it deserved. So after, after while on the White House beat and, you know, just coincidental beat rotation put me on the plane with President George W. Bush on 9-11, um, I once again said, now it's time to do something about this. Like we've got to have focused coverage about race on the level of a specialty like sports or politics or business news or criminal justice, it, education, you know, it had to be a beat. Um, so while I was juggling the furor of, um, world service and foreign affairs and all of that, I began cultivating that idea. And, um, after the, as the Bush administration died down, I approached AP with this idea, Hey, can we have specialized race and ethnicity coverage? So in typical AP fashion, they said, sure, boom, you're the race and ethnicity editor and no money, no staff, no nothing. Let's let's weave gold out of straw. Right. <laughs> um, but but after a few years and they began to see the importance of putting resources into it um, by 2016, we created a custom team for this coverage and much to my, well, not really to my surprise, because I knew this would happen. The industry did follow after AP made that announcement that we were going to have specialized race, ethnicity coverage. Um, Al Jazeera followed, NPR followed, the New York Times followed, the Wall Street Journal followed. Uh, so it was a pleasure to see those changes taking place. 
And also just for, I, I guess I should credit these media institutions for following their nose on the issue as it began to evolve. We still relate to the party. I mean, but the presidency of Barack Obama compelled them to see that they couldn't have a blinder on where race was concerned. And we can we can get in more into that later. Um, so I, um, by 2019, um, I decided to retire from the AP and, but I, but I was bothered by this story I began to see continuing to emerge, which was the political and civic engagement of African-American women, the way, the way that we vote, the way that we engage, it just was taking on an increasing intensity from the young women who started Black Lives Matter up to the, the rank and file who marched into the voting booths in Alabama in 2017 and sent a Democrat to the Senate for the first time in a generation. So I said, Black women as a news story needs to be reported with more depth and specificity. And depth and specificity is also something we'll talk about as we go. So I, I started, a, uh, I launched a startup, Black Women Unmuted, because these sisters were on mute. They were doing it the whole time, but the media had us on mute. Like, <laughs> uh, so I said, we've got to take the sisters off mute. And we are doing that. We're taking them off mute one story at a time because we're still very much a startup. So while I'm weaving the startup together, um, in comes Inside Climate News saying, you know, we actually would love to engage on the racial story in America, They're, the environmental justice matters in this country are becoming more serious. So we need to do something with that. We don't necessarily need an expert in the environment. We need an expert on race. So I said, OK, let's do this. And in January of this year, I joined Inside Climate News to sort of pull those race angles out and report them again with more depth and specificity. Uh, and that brings us to where we are in this industry right now in terms of next leveling race coverage. That was kind of the long explanation, but uh, I know it's you asked exactly for Exactly what I needed, and I, and I have to ask the fellows if they're feeling the same sense of awe that I'm feeling because you're literally looking at the person who's responsible for race coverage at major uh, media organizations in this country. This is not just a concept or a, a theme. Sonia Ross is that person. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if you think of yourself that way, Sonia, but my gosh, it's pretty impressive. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, you know, when you're in the middle of doing it, you don't really think about it in those terms. It's going to take the historians to suss it out. And I'm very worried about that. If, if I, I'm, I'm, I'm pleased that the first draft of history we are giving to the historians of the future has been imbued with a lot more race and ethnic um, information on our population and it's trans this country's transformation. But I'm worried about what's going on right now with burying this information out of fear over CRT and misunderstanding and all of this. And erasure is definitely a risk. And and we're we're not really covering the erasure. So I'm not sure how well, we can how we can avoid that. We've got to do a better job. So I said I wouldn't be surprised if the credit ends up going in another direction on who did what to make what happen. I just hope I'm leaving a big enough footprint for people to understand that um, this is something that needed to be developed and it has been developing for a long time. I just I applaud you for not only you know being instrumental in that early process, but in saying you know you had retired. But now you step right back into the mix and you're doing it in a different sector. It's very impressive. I, I have to go ahead before you start your presentation. Torrance has a hand raised up and he won't let me live it down. If I don't it let it sounds like Torrance has a church hand up. But <laughs> Oh, is that just your church hand? Or did you? It, could, it could be. I'm just saying it sounds like you spearheaded a pioneer race and ethnicity coverage. And I, was, I think like that is amazing. I don't you know. 
you're speaking from it from your place, but from outside looking in, it's incredible. Um, as a black woman to see you put this much um, effort and to see like the fruits of your labor spawn out throughout the entire industry. I think you deserve your flowers. This was really, I know, because I, I would like to peel back the layers of what the next level of race coverage looks like for us from your perspective. But I think, you know, I would be remiss if we didn't give you your flowers like in real time, because that's like a really revolutionary thing that you've done. And, um, and you know, we really appreciate that. I'm sorry, that, that was my amen. And, <laughs> and, uh, it was. Well, that's why I had to add my own amen, because I've seen so the names on your Ross throughout my own career yeah. and uh it's a not only a pleasure to meet her finally <laughs> but to to hear these uh insights so sonia before we get too foot deep into this love fest please start with your uh, your presentation about inside climate news and we could take it from there okay um can everybody see this okay yes yes okay and i pray i'll be able to go from screen to screen. Um, it's no secret that climate change is real. And it's, it's also in, uh, something that we are very aware of that, that, that we have been busily destroying this planet that we live on. And we, we don't have a planet B, as a lot of the environmentalists like to say. Um, and we're tearing down our house uh, and and the impact of this is very real. So when you couple that with what's always gone on in terms of dumping, or I guess you could call it enviro, enviro violence <laughs> uh, on communities of color, boom, there you have a most amazing story that, again, is underreported. So let's talk about the importance of telling these kinds of stories in the first place. And let's start with the place I love to start, which is the plea from the publishers of Freedom's Journal. Um, I love those two men, um, Samuel Cornish and John Russworm, launched the first um, Black-owned publication in the United States in 1827, Freedom's Journal, to tell the stories of what's going on among enslaved and free Black people in this country and addressing the concerns they had about what was going on um, in 1827. So we're getting close up on 200 years ago. They said, hey, we need we need to own our narrative, all right? That's the language that's used for it today. The parlance now is own our, owning your narrative. We want to own our narrative. We wish to plead our own cause. Um, too many people have spoken for us in the past and it's time we wanna speak up for ourselves. So that's to me, that to me is a rallying cry for any journalist of color or what, Ever community you represent in terms of owning a narrative in your own voice, adding your voice to the discourse is so important. All right. So I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with the Kerner Commission. We're going to fast forward from 1827 to 1968 because we don't have a lot of time. But uh, what the Kerner Commission said after um, studying why America burst into flames every summer in, in the Black community or the Negro community. Um, they said, you know, uh, we have two separate nations going on here. And you, the media, are complicit in exacerbating this problem because you don't cover the other community in America, the Negro community. You need to do a better job. And they made some concrete suggestions, but out of this was birthed what's called the race beat. Uh, let's, let's put a reporter on it. Okay, let's hire a black reporter. We got one. Um, let's, let's have them do a story or two Give them an editor. Okay, city editor X is now your editor. And that's not like X is in Malcolm. That's like just generic city editor. So this reporter, <clears throat> excuse me, would go to their editor 
and pitch stories, and the editor would say, I don't see how that's news, or I don't get it. And oftentimes, stories would die in the womb. Well, the stories that did get out were stories that were either too big to ignore or were unusual in some kind of way or, or that would spark curiosity or make people want to learn more. But the main frustration for those who worked the race beat in the classic sense was that they couldn't get their editors and the decision makers where they worked to pay attention to the stories they saw unfolding on the ground. This coverage got treated like it was something separate from the news that was being reported in general by the newspapers um, and the local affiliates and radio. Uh, so when the only way that these reporters could realistically get the attention of their editors was to report what was wrong. What's, what's going wrong? Um, the, the most classic example of this that I can think of that's not a civil rights type, uh, that's not cast in the civil rights mode, was the whole push on education of why Johnny can't read uh, from the 70s. It was all about um, the, the, the difference academically with black children and how so many were coming, going to school and coming out of it without certain skill sets, like knowing how to read. So the coverage began to get tainted by pathology. It was built around bad things, um, poor performance on tests, uh, higher death rates, uh, crime, these sorts of things. Um, and that yielded chew, what I like to call chew. These are the subject matters that would dominate race coverage. If it, it bleeds, it leads, right? And most of the time that's racial. Oh, the, you know, life expectancy, health issues, um, illness, death, infant mortality, maternal mortality, all these things, um, chronic disease, housing, lack thereof, you know, um, um, poor performance in school, and we ain't got no money, y'all. All of these things were the genesis of race coverage for at least two generations in media. Well, why does this need to change? Why can't we just continue to report this into time immemorial? Well, here's why. Because the United States is changing, is turning into something else. The, and you all know this, you're product of this very society, um, that the nation will not have any race that is a majority within the next 23 years. OK, so how in the world are we going to tell this story if all we focus on is death? mayhem and chaos. Sure, surely there's more to it. Um, and United, the United States will be so segmented. How in the world can we do, the, do a good job of telling this story if we don't change our ways? I mean, look at this. Here is where it's going. And look at the fastest growing groups and imagine that pie chart changing over time. And what issues are contained within each slice of this pie? And how do we get to this? Every other institution in this country is trying to adjust it, adjust to it. And just like media, every other aspect of the society, every other segment is burying its head in the sand like, no, I don't want to think about it, which leads us right back to where we sit within the fourth estate. How do we give them the information they need to better equip themselves and pull them pull their heads out of the sand. So here's how we can do this, because you know I would come with some suggestions. All right. Well, we've got to do a better job with the race beat. And we need, instead of having this one person, we need to start doing a deep dive within every area we cover and pull those race angles out and tell those stories with, drum roll, more depth and specificity. 
Um, so yeah, anybody who covers anything can actually become a race reporter if they open their eyes and dig those race angles that are unfolding in front of them out and tell them great in a better way. And I mean, while we're at it, since we have this big new an big animal called social media in front of us and every other digital aspect of our um, way of communicating in this country, why don't we use those tools to do a better job instead of printing it out and handing it to people or setting it on a TV screen in front of them so they can wait until we tell them what's happening? Why don't we become more flexible in the platforms that we put this information out with? And most importantly, can we please fix our gaze on something other than chew? Can we stop talking through the lens of pathology? All right, I know you said, wait, wait, back up. What's, what's lens of pathology? Is that a new thing? Is that a term? Um, well, that's what I've been talking about for a few years now. And that is taking off that lens of pathology, which means when I report this story or that story, I'm going to start with the outcome of the practice rather than report just the outcome. So that means in education, when I'm handed a study that says Latino children don't perform as well in school as their white counterparts, I'm not going to just report it that way. I'm going to say, well, why? What else is the factor here? My reporting should start with that conclusion rather than reporting just that conclusion and lacking that context. Because again, the times demand that we report with greater depth and specificity. All right, so here is an example. And um, because I'm biased, I pulled it right out of Inside Climate News, how we can get past that lens of pathology. All right, the wildfires that have been happening uh, all through the summer out west, among the towns that were just completely devastated by the wildfires was a very historic community in California, which is one of the oldest timber farming, um, majority black timber farming communities in the country. So, it's one thing to report wildfires destroy these communities in these country, in these areas. And it's another thing to say, hey, remember that historic uh, mill town where all those black people came during the gold rush or whatever? Well, it burnt completely up. Now that's a different story than just housing houses and neighborhoods that got destroyed by wildfire. Plus when you add the imagery of people of color who were displaced or affected by wildfire. It takes on a greater what depth and specificity. And rather than writing a story that says, oh God, these poor people, they lost everything. We explained how valuable this community was. The timber mill itself that gave this community, the people who live there, their jobs, is probably the cause of the fire that destroyed everything they own. So the people who were hurt by this stopped being the victims of it and became a central character in it. And, and we didn't write this with pity. Um, and, and we reported this with respect to their humanity. And these are the things that matter when you take that lens of pathology off. So, we don't have to have people feeling sorry for the folks of we California as much as they now have an understanding of how a wildfire came to destroy a town. And that's the best way to report without a lens of pathology covering your 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 journalism, your journalistic eye. And. The same holds true for this particular story that I'm just in love with. It is a Washington Post story, actually, by the fabulous Daryl Fears, who is just one of the best environmental reporters out there, in my opinion. And he did a story explaining how the Tennessee Valley, Valley Authority came up with a solution to deal with this coal ash by just throwing it into the backs of trucks 
and driving the trucks in a convoy through the black community of South Memphis, Tennessee, on its way to wherever they're getting rid of the coal ash. They made sure that the cap, the uh, cabins of the trucks that haul this stuff had sufficient insulation to keep the coal ash and particulate matter from affecting the drivers. But that meant all day, day in, day out, for however many years, this community is going to have coal ash particulate matter in the air. And they, there was nothing they can do about it because they were so busy fighting off a pipeline through their community for something else that they couldn't, you know, they had to pick their battles. And then before you know it, this decision has been made and it's ramming coal ash into the air in their community. And of course, yes, these trucks drive past schools, parks, churches. Um, so as Black South Memphis residents are going through their daily life, they are breathing in these uh, pollutants. And now back to Inside Climate News, where we don't do lens of pathology coverage. Um, we explain in this particular piece what it's like when you've had an oil well shoved down your community's throat and what it does to people to have to live with these conditions nearby. Um, we don't put, we don't say, oh, these poor people for Yesenia Martinez, who has an oil drill 25 feet from her bedroom window, making noise day and night. We do report that, but we say, guess who's responsible for this? The government of the state of California made this decision to put this gas and oil operation that close to where people live. So that's a different approach than just, oh, these, this community has oil wells in it. This is why removing the lens of pathology matters so much. And since this is a Latino community that we are talking about affected by this, we would have been remiss if we didn't make this story available to people who do not speak English to read it. So we translated it into Spanish and and shared it that way as well. Um, one of the biggest problems with climate news is that um, people, especially Spanish speaking people are actively searching for this information and falling victim to disinformation because they need news and information that's in Spanish. So if they put the, the, the purveyors of disinformation say, well, if I put it in Spanish, they'll, act, they'll share it for me. Uh, you see, so so it's incumbent upon media who are reliable and trustworthy to also report this news and languages beyond English so that people are not stuck trying to understand what's going on around them. Again, removing the lens of pathology. So we're not just saying um, Hispanic people are hurt by this. We're also giving equipping them with the information they need to know what's going on and affecting them. Um, then you also have, instead of the occasional story, um, oh, there's an EPA Superfund in, in Atlanta. We said, let's go to that community and find out what it's like to live in the middle of a Superfund. So we did a three-part series about an area adjacent to Atlanta's glittery new football stadium, the Mercedes-Benz Stadium, um, a 637-acre area that has been contaminated with lead for generations. And the people in that community told us interesting things among them. Um, oh, now they want to clean it up? This, this pollution has been here for generations. I mean, the city councilman for the area who grew up there said, oh, that's lead, tainted slag. But I thought they were rocks. I played with them as a child. So we went into the community to tell the story from the inside out rather than running to the area to report from the outside in. 
that is one of the easiest ways to remove the lens of pathology when you are reporting on the concerns that affect people in the communities where they live, particularly people of color. So what happened with this whole thing? The local residents were very mistrustful of the EPA. EPA said, look, we came to clean it up once they told us it was there. Well, who told you? An Emory University graduate student. Okay, so the locals were like, <coughs> excuse me, I'm sorry, but I'm too busy fighting off mold contamination and storm uh, storm overflow and and removal of native trees that's making my backyard flood to care about those lead tainted rocks that they're cleaning up out, out of this area. So they had to, again, pick their battles on how they would deal with this. And the, nobody wanted to do the lead test, the blood test that will tell them whether they've been exposed to lead contamination. Nobody really wanted to allow the EBA to come in and test their soil for contamination. What if it jacks up my property value? And then oh, what if the landlord finds out there's lead here and then they want to unload the property and I have to move? They were looking at gentrification pressuring their neighborhood. So it was more than just an EPA uh, Superfund site the size of Disneyland uh, needing to be cleaned up, you see. So it's so important to take that lens of pathology off in reporting about communities where people of color live and reporting about people of color themselves. Now, I know you all know all of this, and if not all, at least some of this, and do this as you go. So this is where you can be instructive to your newsrooms, to your, your supervisors, your editors, your decision makers on how, to, how you can do a better job in this type of coverage. The first thing, which is a tool that every reporter should employ, is to ask themselves, who do you think is on the receiving end of the news that you're putting out there? As you report your story, do you see white people in your head or do you see people who look like you? If you find yourself thinking I'm informing George and Martha in Kansas who are going to be reading this with a gee golly factor to it, stop yourself and replace that with additional people of color being on the receiving end of your journalism as news consumers. That is like the best thing that you can do in covering race and ethnic transformation of the United States. The next thing you should do is study whatever subject it is that you want to pull these race angles out of and develop your personal expertise. Race, is, race in and of itself is an amorphous kind of greasy pig. It's unctuous. You can't grab it. It'll slide away from you. You got to try to grab it again. It'll slide off in another direction. So you need to anchor your knowledge with some subject, whatever that subject is, sports, health. Uh, well, chew, you know, you can take those. You can take the pathologies out of those, education, business, et cetera, and develop some personal expertise and then go after the race within that area, which is exactly what's happening with my, my presence at Inside Climate News. I'm not the biggest environmentalist in the world. Um, I'm coming into the subject to develop personal expertise, but I'm applying what I know about race to those stories to help expand the um, amount of depth and specificity that we employ in reporting uh, in our journalism every day. Um, do your best to avoid things like stereotypes and success unicorns and kitchen sink coverage. And by, um, let me explain, well, I don't think I need to explain stereotypes to anybody here, but success unicorns. Success unicorns are the imaginary people of color who've done absolutely amazing things because there's be there are better stories within those unicorn stories. And by that, I mean um, the 13 year old who graduates from Yale Medical School and invented um, some new heart valve device. Uh, young geniuses. If you want to report about young geniuses, dial it back 10 years and find that young genius and see what they're up to today. 
But success unicorns are those stories that make people feel good about um, how they want to view people of color. Oh, um, you never tell the good news about us. And here, my 11-year-old son started a Fortune 500 company. Well, okay, that's great. But what with real with real media scrutiny on it, I don't know if they want that story told, right? Um, so try to avoid that and tell a more real story about that circumstance. And then kitchen sink coverage is the old way of covering race. Kitchen sink coverage is white people say this, minorities say that. And the minorities are all of these groups that by 2045 are going to be the majority of people in this country. So you can't just lump all people of color together in one category. All right. Try your best not to be a thumb sucker for Americans who can't handle or are uncomfortable with the way the race story plays out. You can't. You can't give in to whims because people find that news upsetting or because they're not comfortable with your premise or it's not telling them what they want to hear or what they want to believe about this or that racial situation. OK, um, one of the biggest examples of this in terms of resisting the conformity for the comfort of the majority is that Georgia Senate race between Herschel Walker and Raphael Warnock. All right. Um, all through the process, people have failed to engage the one simple fact that the state of Georgia, which has always been uh, a paragon of racial bias and discrimination and, and voter suppression, however you want to put it, the voters there are trying to decide between two black men to send to the U.S. Senate. What's the history of that? And more importantly, what is the where do the voters who most resemble the candidates lie? How many people really talk to black male voters about that election? Is it because there may not be much comfort with that premise? So, you know, you can't you can't just fall into what's comfortable for people to hear. It's rare to get news that way. If you take the race angles off of it and make it about any other subject, uh, most newsrooms will have no problem resisting conformity for the comfort of the majority, you know. Uh, so try your best not to fall into being a thumb sucker so that the society won't get upset about the news that you're per, um, putting out there. And then, which speaks to what I just said, try to frame the news, put yourself in the shoes of the most marginalized people involved in the journalism that you're doing you know and sometimes that might mean i need to understand these trump voters and these trump supporters and why they think the way they do so try to go in put yourself in their shoes so you can understand where they're coming from it doesn't mean that you got to buy into what they're selling it just means you got to know where they sit and how they how they got there most importantly how they got there because again that's a tool to help you get past the lens of pathology. And then the last most important thing that's almost as important as changing who you see in your mind's eye when you report, follow up. One thing that has been lacking in our industry is follow up. Clear, concise, deep, specific follow up. Um, it, you, there used to be a time when the next story came from the last story. But in this, this um, cycle where we now operate, uh, the 24 seven breakneck pace keeps us from being able to follow up because we actually have moved on to the next thing. And the result is a lack of complete storytelling. And, after, and because there's no real complete storytelling, there is an absence of true institutional knowledge about exactly what happened every step of the way. So do your best to follow up whatever you reported before. Go back and dig into those sources again and say, what's the latest? Um, what's the latest doesn't get asked as often now as it should. But if you do these things, you know, you will do a very good job of taking that lens of pathology off 
and reporting on the racial dynamics of this country and <laughs> with specificity to what we are doing today, climate change and its impact on people of color, not just in this country, but around the globe, you'll do that more successfully. I just want to let uh, the journalists know that we may have a bit of a shorter break today after this session, because I think we have so many questions. But I see Mabinti, uh, please introduce yourself. Hello, hello. Hi, uh, my name is Mabinti Porshi, and I'm a political reporter at USA Today. And like Rachel said, I have a ton of questions. I'm only going to ask one or two. So <laughs> anyone else who wants to ask can, but if no one else asks, I'm going to keep going. Um, my first question is something that's been bothering me or worrying me. Um, you know, it's been two years since, quote unquote, a racial uprising, and we're starting to see newsrooms contract and, and let people go. And I'm, I'm wondering what that means for diversity coverage, right? If we're getting smaller, how do we, as journalists of color, especially journalists of color who do want to write about, you know, race, gender, sexuality, um, you know, all of these identities that maybe don't get the coverage they do need. How do you do that? Because to me, it kind of feels like we're like, it feels like a cyclical thing where you, you make progress and then you get your backlash. And it's like, well, what do we do um, to be, you know, most of us are, you know, not necessarily 20 years in the game, right? How do you, and I'm just thinking about 2023, how to, navigate that and how to, as you said, push that coverage forward if there's only so much you can do because your newsroom is contracting yeah. rather than expanding. Well, you know, newsrooms are only doing what they've always done. And and after the whole um, reckoning that happened, um, that flared after the death of George Floyd, which I think is what you're talking about, mm -hmm. I felt then that our industry was only going to be patient with that for so long before they ran off to the next bright, shiny thing. Okay. And this is what um, media have traditionally done. Run off to the next bright, shiny thing. We've been down this road before. I mean, we had a similar reckoning after Rodney King. And what happened? Uh, media ran off to the next bright, shiny thing, which was Bill Clinton's impeachment and O.J. Simpson. Um, you have to think war, not battle, as you go about your reporting and understand that just as they cyclically move away, they will cyclically come back. So you have to equip yourself to be ready when the pendulum swings back over here, which requires you to think long term strategy, war not short-term strategy, battle. Sometimes the stories just won't be hot for a while. But if you plant yourself, you are there for the hot story and you may be the one that pushes that pendulum back in the other direction with what you bring to the table about it. Okay, so since you know you were an expert on, on race coverage and then you became a White House reporter, can you talk to us about like how that influenced the ways you covered the White House and and you know, these presidential administrations? Well, you know, it it actually was just fortuitous timing, I think, more than anything, because Bill Clinton was president at the time. He was walking around here with honorary brother status. But what was interesting to me is <laughs> how um, White House reporters just treated that as kind of matter of fact. Oh, Black people love Bill Clinton. I went in there and being a junior cub on that beat, you know, you get the crappy shifts. They say, oh, the president's going to play golf. Here, go go watch him. So you have to find a way to distinguish yourself. And I had walked in there with a quiver full of racial arrows. And I said, let me just start shooting a few around to see what I get. Um, and started, started digging on that one angle, Bill Clinton's honorary blackness and what was it giving us? And through that, well, he had all these um, cozy relationships with black political operatives. He had an extremely diverse White House staff, which at the time was was um, new and different. So, OK, let me talk to some of those people, because nobody really considered them all that much in the know, except for a handful like Ron Brown. Um, so, OK, empowering those people with my little media megaphone. 
uh, was one strategy. Uh, not discounting the black people who worked in the building. You'd be amazed at what the groundskeepers can tell you. Uh, and then Bill Clinton himself came with a lot of very um, diverse uh, things to report. You know, a lot of a lot of it symbolic, uh, but you know, it gave you stead to it gave you stead to ask questions continually. One of the more uh, surprising things, uh, uh, it was just a simple question for me, but it got such a, a weird response that I said, oh, this has got to be a story now. I just casually asked the White House, could I get the president's reaction to Toni Morrison's essay where she described Bill Clinton as the black president um, that we probably the blackest president we will see in our lifetime. Um, granted, this was before anybody saw Barack Obama coming. Right. But um, she talked about his blackness in, in the sense of how he got um, villainized or demonized in the way that black people do, uh, that he had a whole lot of black characteristics to his life. And that so, yeah, he's blacker than any black president we may ever elect when you think life circumstance and experience. And it took the White House three months to get an answer from me. They bug tussled it over it for a long time to the point where I said, it's just it's just an essay. But what it said to me is there's more there. And. And then he went into a whole national dialogue on race and um, what it means and, and how we need to change and as a society and the approach that we take to each other. Uh, he appointed a commission. It just grew into a thing, you know, but in the midst of that, they couldn't ask a simple question about this essay where she said he's a black man, he's a black president. So. Uh, he finally did answer it by going to the Congressional Black Caucus's dinner and joking about it. Uh, but I followed, I followed that for a long time. And through the lens of history now, you see how much more interesting that is than what was going on at the time. You know, I think he was brought in some long term but very unsuccessful um, Mideast peace talks and Sharm El Sheikh and other places determined to have a historic Mideast peace deal to add to his accomplishments and burnish his legacy. But all of this was in the mix on it too. So history will determine what Clinton's legacy is. So you have to care about the tall and the small. I want to jump and ask you about uh, your recent uh, inside climate story about climate disinformation. We had a speaker at our session last month, several speakers who talked about a new report on <laughs> disinformation directed to black female candidates and how it is uh, actually just out of control and, and the impact on them. So I found it interesting. Uh, I'll put the link in the, in the uh, chat right now. I sent this story to the journalist last night. Right, let's talk about this. When you talk about the lens of pathology and the challenges that people of color face, mm -hmm. uh, it's just astonishing to me that <clears throat> those, two term, those two tactics, mis and disinformation, are used against them in every sector. But tell us about this story that you all produce. Um, well, you know, Bob Irwin, who is, he he can go to the bottom of the ocean on any of these um, climate issues from a global perspective. He uh, he is actually based in Europe for us. And it, the, essentially, this report got right down to like every other form of disinformation, climate disinformation is jacking up the decision making processes and um, things that matter. Now, for us, it was the election, but for climate change, it is COP27 and the ability of the nations of the world to come together, to come to some sort of agreement on how we deal with the way we're tearing this planet up. Um, 
And actually, it gets so deep and apocalyptic sometimes that I have to say, Bob, I got to pull my head out of this one for a minute uh, to understand it. But um, basically, the feud over climate denial and is it real and what the climate climate scientists say and what they haven't said um, takes on a political dimension. And then the disinformation apparatus that's already there just takes it and runs with it. So given the way people of color get treated, bullied, if you will, on social media platforms and whatnot, why is it anybody surprised that we also get villainized and picked on and and mistreated and targeted um, by these very very same disinformation mechanisms? Um, At least that was my takeaway uh, on it. And again, that highlights the very important message that you have a seat at the table and you are shaping and guiding the way this information is analyzed. Um, I literally, we could keep you here all afternoon, Sonia, so, but take one more question from the journalists before we wrap up, and that would be Amanda. Amanda, go ahead. Hi, Sonia. Thanks so much. Um, my name is Amanda. I cover um, energy and environment in New Hampshire for the New Hampshire Bulletin. Um, our state is predominantly white. It is diversifying rapidly. So I was curious if you had thoughts or insights on covering race and the intersection of race and environment in, in a place that is demographically pretty, pretty white. Say go back um, into newspaper archives or whatever archives are available to you and look at some of the most notorious NIMBY battles, the not in my backyard battles where you're not going to put that landfill here or you're not going to build that highway there and figure out where it ultimately went. Where did they put the landfill and where did they put the road? Because invariably that's going to lead you to the communities where they then put the people of color. Um, You can look back at the building of the interstate highway system in that particular city. What was there when it was built? What's there now? Um, You can look at gentrification as a guiding force. Where is the trendy part of town right now? And what was it before? And then see what's going on environmentally in that area. Is there a Superfund site over there that was supposed to have been cleaned up in 1971 and hasn't been yet? Is is there, uh, how many gas stations are in this particular community within a one block radius or one mile radius and compare that to another part of town. How many are in that area? Um, isn't that a concentration of greenhouse gas emissions? Um, isn't that uh, leaving these communities subject to a greater amount of particulate matter? Because where's the freeway ramp? And do these children in this community have asthma? Um, even without putting a color on the people in those areas, you invariably will find what where the people of color are, are being uh, herded and exposed because that's just been the pattern um, throughout American history. It, and, and I think it's very interesting. And I want to say we have a story, com- if it's not, it's coming, about a similar situation in Texas where there was a, a plan to build a road um, and then they abandoned the plan after the neighborhood gentrified. And now it's not dominated by people of color. I want to say it's in Austin, Texas, but um, we're going to bring that to you so you can can gnaw on it. And then pick up on those threads that you find in your archival searches and follow them. And that will take you to the stories. Sonia, it has been a privilege. Wait a minute. I'm looking at the chat to see if there are any pressing, urgent questions. I have um, uh, all right. Well, I, I told you all we're going to have a shorter break this time. So let's keep it going. Uh, Gabby. Sorry. Uh, my name is Gabrielle Settles. I'm a reporter from PolitiFact. And so we do cover um, climate change and misinformation. So that was a perfect lead in. Um, what I wanted to know more is specifically 
Where are you finding the misinformation that is affecting the people of color um, who are being affected by climate change or climate change misinformation rather that is being directed at people of color, uh, Spanish misinfo, Black misinfo, uh, the like? Um, where do you think that I and my colleagues should be looking? Um, you know, one place you could start is with this group called Green Latino. Um, Green Latino put out a report about this uh, Spanish disinformation campaign. We have one of our fellows working on it now, but just in a broader sense. So her piece hasn't quite isn't quite ready to run yet. Uh, but but Green Latino uh, did put out a report and and that talked about where this misinformation comes from more often than not. Some of them, the largest operations, I believe, are in Spain. In, in terms of putting the disinformation out in Spanish, but they're not the ones spreading it in every instance. Most of the spreading is done by Spanish speaking people who want who are hungry for climate information in Spanish. Um, so imagine what it'll take to combat that. That would take media operations coming up with a way to truly report this subject in Spanish. Now, there are some operations out there, many of them in Latin America that are doing a good job of that. But again, that also doesn't help um, the people in Latino communities who don't speak Spanish and they need it in English. So that disconnect where media operations are choosing one or the other language has to be bridged. And in most cases, those stories need to be out there in both languages. We have a comment from Laura who says that uh, there's a project going on in Houston right now uh, called the I-45 project. Yes. Tell mm -hmm. us about that. She said people are speaking out against it. Oh, yeah. Sorry. My internet connection is awful. So I, I've been com coming in and out, but I've really enjoyed listening to oh. you. Um, but no, I, I just I I just feel really strongly about it. Um, but basically, hold on. Let me see if my camera will turn on. Let's see. No, maybe not. Okay, that's okay. We can hear you. Oh, here we go. Hi. Hi, I'm Laura. I work with uh, Pointer. I am a, an audience editor with MediaWise now, but I was working at the Houston Chronicle, and I was just making a comment about how this I-45 project um, is like they're, they're going really back and forth right now, and thankfully, a lot of the public is speaking up against it because they finally recognize how harmful it is because they've done it in the past. <laughs> I was just adding a comment about how that is like still happening and there's people who are still putting, you know, highways above people. <laughs> yeah, um, pick know. a city, pick a city, you'll find yeah. one of these. And again, we, not to fault media, we, we got hit by a full on gale force hurricane named Donald Trump for like five or six years. And at a time when media industry were sorely lacking resources and media felt we had to throw all our resources into that story. So in prioritizing, certain things fell by the wayside. And this is one of them. And with, with shrinking newsrooms, there are not a lot of resources to put at stories like this, even though there is a desire for stories like this. So really it amounts to the editorial decisions being made in real time by the reporters who go out to get the news and come back with a, making a compelling case for why this story needs to be reported. Sonia, I'm looking forward to working with you in the coming years uh, to do more trainings around this issue. Mm -hmm. I loved it when we spoke the other day about the possibility of doing a training at a super fun site or near one. But I want to take this opportunity to wrap this session up by saying it's a privilege for me to finally get to meet you and know you and thanking you so much for coming to speak to the Widening the Pipeline journalists. Well, thank you for having me. And I just hope all of you um, who are out here putting yourself in the pipeline to move on to bigger and better things will drag one behind you. Um, make sure you're replenishing that pipeline as you travel through it. That's what's so important.